And Mark Cuban was actually one of our earliest investors. So he's like, make me an offer. So we go all hands on deck and we're writing up this email and we think we're so clever and we're like, oh, we'll, we'll paint a sea glider with Mavericks livery and we'll deliver it to your beach house and we'll teach you how to fly it and you can do all these great vacation operations. You get the very first one off the line that we're so clever. And he basically comes back to us and says, make me a deal with money. <laughs> we're talking valuation here. W- what's it going to take? All players, low down, What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. I'm Mike. This is The Merge, where we make sense of defense in an enjoyable way. Today's episode is special. We have an interview with Billy Talheimer from Regent. You're going to hear about some funny looking airplanes slash boats slash things called sea gliders. Make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe. Follow us on the socials. Check us out on YouTube so you can put faces to the voices and you can see some of the pictures and the videos of the things that we're going to talk about in this interview. Enjoy. All right, today we're talking about airplanes that fly, but they're not airplanes. Uh, it's not a trivia question. Uh, today we're going to be talking wigs and sea gliders with Billy Talheimer. He's the co-founder and CEO of Regent. Welcome, Billy. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Uh, longtime readers, before we had a podcast, uh, back in October of 2022, we actually featured Regent as a topic in the newsletter. Uh, so we dusted that off. We figured it was time to check in and see how you guys are doing. Uh, and killed two birds with one stone. So have you guys on the pod as well. Yeah, I remember that newsletter. That was my first introduction to to wing and ground effect. No, I take it back. It was my second introduction to wing and ground effect. I had just come back from a, a falconry experience in a winery where we got to play with a, a hawk who did the, the low swoop, would glide over the ground for a bit, and then we had the conversation about the increased efficiency. Yeah. I've been focused on obviously ground effect for a long time, but I remember that was one of the first sort of your, your guys was one of the first sort of publications in the defense space that talked about the applicability of sea gliders there. And that was, that was just a, a huge win for us and, and actually uh, brought in so many inbounds like, Oh, we hadn't really thought about this before. We hadn't thought about this since the Akrana planes. I'm sure we'll talk about those. Um, but it was a great way to start a relationship. Yeah, I mean, mission accomplished. That's why I started the merge was to was to highlight companies and ideas and ways to transform uh, national security, to make it safer for everyone. So, and in the process, you can move people around uh, on the commercial side. And so, you're one of the few, I think, hardware dual use company startups that I've uh, that I've come across in a while, like truly dual uh, dual use, which is a weird word that Jake doesn't like to talk about the parties, but. Uh, <laughs> so for people who aren't tracking uh, what we're talking about here, uh, Bill, you want to give us just a rundown of like, what is a wig and specifically the sea glider? Absolutely. Well, Regent builds sea gliders. Uh, sea gliders are hydrofoiling wing and ground effect vehicles. There's a lot of technical uh, mumbo jumbo in that. So we are wave tolerant hybrids of boats and planes. Um, so I'll start on that sort of wig part that we called out before. So uh, WIG stands for Wing in Ground Effect, uh, W-I-G or WIG. Uh, very hard to Google. You don't get uh, flying machines when you Google wigs. You get hair. So, uh, you know, we sort of created a new uh, a new word, a new brand within that space. Um, but wigs have actually been around for 60 years. Uh, they started in, the, in really the 1960s uh, in the Soviet Union at the time with these large uh, ships called a chronoplons, which are sort of massive battleships that flied over the the Baltic Sea, and also we're actually around a similar time in Germany playing with some different designs. Um, but the concept of a wing and ground effect vehicle is that they are flying machines, so they look like airplanes, they have wings, but they're over the surface of the water. So they're always staying within a wingspan of the surface, doing dock to dock, over water transportation only, and they're basically flying on a dynamic cushion of air. And because of that, uh, they get lift augmentation, they get drag reduction, they get uh, efficiency gains that give us extended range, which is especially important for us uh, because sea gliders that region builds are all electric vehicles. So just a, a little bit more on ground effect, you know, it's the same dynamic cushion of air that you see birds flying on, you know, when a pelican's gliding over the surface, when Jake's falcons are gliding over the surface, they're flying on the ground effect. It's also the same feeling that you get on a commercial aircraft. You know, every aircraft, when they're low over the runway, flies in ground effect. So you think about a really turbulent approach, sort of bumping around, coming over the runway, 
And then right before you land, the engines spool back and you sort of float for a second before the wheels touch down. That last second of, of sort of floating uh, is the ground effect as well. So sea gliders and, and all wigs fly within the ground effect at all times. And what differentiates a sea glider from all of the past failed attempts at wigs uh, is that sea gliders are wave tolerant. So we can operate uh, in waves up to five feet. We can operate in all sorts of weather conditions. If the airplanes are flying, the sea gliders are going. Uh, we can maneuver through harbors in a safe, controlled way. Uh, and we get that wave tolerance and maneuverability from our hydrofoils. So we couple hydrofoil systems with the wing and ground, and that's a sea glider. It looks like an airplane, and you said flying. How predictable are, are wave conditions? Yeah, so um, hit on both parts of those. So on, on the airplane part first. So wing and ground and, and sea gliders, they, they do look like airplanes. They fly on the air, uh, but they always do so within a wingspan of the surface of the water. So uh, you think about the altitudes here. Sea gliders will actually be flying about 10 to 30 feet over the surface of the water. So we're talking fairly low, and that's because you're in this sort of aerodynamic regime where the wings are sort of pressurizing that air over the surface. The physical way to think about that is, you know, the high pressure air under a wing that holds a plane up is more efficient if you can push on a hard surface beneath it, like the surface of the water or, or the surface of the, the earth, uh, than it is just pushing on more air beneath it at altitude. So that's why uh, at a very simple level, that's why ground effect works. Um, to Jake's point, you know, how uh, predictable are the waves in these conditions? Um, well, to some extent, it sort of depends on where you are, but you can model waves and there are, you know, hydrodynamic methods of doing that. Um, but it also puts a huge burden on our sensor system. So one, one of region's secret sauce is basically being able to do low level terrain following map of earth flight at, at pretty high speeds and low altitudes, but to do it over a surface that is constantly moving, a dynamic surface. So we use uh, different sensor technologies and sort of fuse them together. We use filtering uh, methods in our software. Sea gliders are safe because we implement a digital flight control system. So you look back through history, some of the past attempts at WIGs are human flown and people are sort of fighting you know, the wig to keep it off the, the ground the whole time. When we approach this, we said, we're going to take all this amazing technology uh, in digital flight controls and envelope protection and sensor systems. We're going to have the sea glider fly itself and maintain that safe altitude over the water at all times. And then the human captain can do what humans do really well, which is navigate and communicate and look for obstacles and avoid them, things like that. Not a pilot. You call them a, a captain. captain. You got it. Very specific in my word choice. How do you qualify a wig captain slash pilot? Like there's no other aircraft like it to get, you know, be an instructor on like who, how do you certify people to fly it? And then who certifies the, the captains? Super important distinction there. Uh, so our sea gliders are always over water in that, in that near water regime, right? So you think about this dock to dock over water transportation, uh, flying 10 to 30 feet over the water, you're going to be looking up at sailboat masts. You know, you're going to be looking up at cruise ships. A cruise ship captain will have a higher vantage point over the water than a sea glider will. So we're very much in the maritime environment. We're not going into airspace. We're not deconflicting with air traffic. We're not landing at airports. Uh, and so there is uh, an international law that is uh, actually basically taken up and, and uh, reflected by many of the national laws around the world, the majority of them, uh, that sea gliders and wigs in general are under the jurisdiction of the maritime authorities rather than the aviation authorities. And it's because of that operational context that, uh, you know, a, a captain of a wig uh, needs to know things like red, right, return and, and, and the coal regs and sort of right of ways at sea and maritime navigation. And the airspace really doesn't matter to them. And like how, how you move around an airport is really not as applicable. Um, so, the vessels, sea gliders are vessels mar uh, that are regulated under maritime law, and so too are the crew. Uh, so what Regent's done is we've actually abstracted away the difficult parts of operating a sea glider, your altitude control and that sort of low-level flight, your roll control, pitch control, your uh, even takeoff and landing maneuvers. All of that is now controlled by our digital flight control system. The only thing the captains are doing is boat controls. The only thing that's left is left and right, fast and slow. So you drive it like a boat, whether you are in any of our three modes. So sea gliders float, foil, and fly. You board it at the dock like a boat or ferry. You then rise up on those hydrofoils as you go through the harbor to give you maneuverable wave-tolerant operations. 
And then you take off from those hydrofoils and you fly in the ground effect at high speeds on your destination. So whether you're floating like a boat, foiling like an America's Cup uh, racing yacht uh, or flying uh, like a winged ground effect vehicle, at all times, it's just 2D operations, left and right, fast and slow, uh, and the digital flight controls do the rest. And so the training for these systems, uh, you start off just like any commercial sea captain would. You, you get your uh, maritime master's license. Uh, and then where a, a maritime master would go off and get a high-speed ferry endorsement uh, or a, um, uh, a hovercraft endorsement or even a hydrofoil ferry endorsement like they have in, in Japan and in Hong Kong, now you can go off and get your sea glider endorsement, uh, which will be a certification process that our region offers. So we'll, we'll, we'll offer the training course, six to eight, eight week training course uh, to give that sort of final endorsement for sea glider operations. You just rolled out a, a full scale prototype uh, or a, mock, a mock up or a model, I think, of your first one, which is uh, 12 passengers, 3,500 pounds, uh, 180 miles, something like that. Is that right? Yeah. So we unveiled uh, our full scale sea glider prototype design, sort of a design mock up. Uh, so that is a 12 passenger and two crew vehicle uh, that we call Viceroy. And that's the, the first product we're bringing to market here. Uh, so we unveiled recently in April sort of the, the design of that vessel and our engineering team is really hard at work right now, uh, building that, putting it together, integration going on over the first half of next year. Uh, we'll get in the water next year, sort of late next summer and fly by the end of next year. So uh, we're moving super fast, but that'll be a, a human crewed full scale sea glider prototype. So you just spent like the last five minutes telling us how the sea glider is not an airplane. What is the name of this, uh, your first product? So uh, sea gliders are sort of the, the class of vehicle, right? Regent builds a bunch yeah. of sea gliders. Our first product is called Viceroy. Uh, that is our 12 passenger product or 3,500 pounds of payload. Uh, and our next product sort of by the end of the decade is called Monarch. And actually it turns out that all these uh, technologies scale really well. So hydrofoil technology and the hydrodynamics get easier at scale. Uh, the ground effect gets more powerful at scale, more aerodynamically favorable at scale. So we can actually take all this technology from our all-electric 12-seater, scale it up to a 100-seater or 25,000 pounds of payload uh, vehicle that we call Monarch. Um, when we are sort of designing these systems and, and wanting to name them, you know, we looked at sort of the aviation and the maritime nomenclature uh, and the birds had all been done and and the cool fish like sharks had been done and we're like we could be a flying fish and there but there's an exoset missile so we couldn't do we couldn't be an exoset uh but then we realized that butterflies are, are very underutilized in aerospace nomenclature uh and and our company name is region so we sort of went with the with the regal titles that are also happen to be butterflies uh monarch and the slightly smaller viceroy just to confuse everyone it's not an airplane but it's gonna we're gonna name it after something that flies anyways <laughs> <laughs> So next question. So Viceroy being like the thing that's a little smaller, looks just like a monarch butterfly, but <laughs> Regent, when every time I see it, Regent, it's all capital. Like it's an acronym. What is, is that stand for something? Uh, it is an acronym. Uh, so yeah, Regent stands for regional electric ground effect, nautical transport. That sounds like a cyber application title to me. Right. Yeah. We, we, we thought long and hard on that one. We, so a lot of the founding team came from aviation. So we figured, you know, we needed an acronym somewhere in this mess. The best acronyms are backronyms, right? <laughs> <laughs> it had to be an acronym. I knew it with uh, your co-founder. Both of you guys came from Aurora, uh, MIT, something like that, right? Exactly. Yeah, we came through Aurora Flight Sciences. We were working on uh, electric aviation at the time in eVTOL. We were in some of the early Boeing eVTOL programs, even pre-WISC. Um, I was uh, conceptual design, performance, and aerodynamics initially moved into um, program management and business development. And my co-founder, Mike, was doing uh, flight controls and autonomy. So I, I sort of had the outside of the airplane, he had the inside of the airplane. Uh, we, could, we could put one together between the two of us, uh, but then decided, you know, there are much better ways of doing this in, in the maritime domain. You just closed the Series A round for sixty million dollars, and uh, I saw some of the headliners of uh, uh, a hardware company coming through Y Combinator, which is uh, very remarkable. Uh, I, I see Mark Cuban and Lockheed Ventures being a uh, part of the the raise. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, super excited to have just closed our our Series A. As you said, it's sixty million dollars. It brings our total raise to 
90 million uh, and we've only been in business for for three years so uh we're, we're moving pretty quick here um 80 90 industries led our round founders fund co-led we had some amazing participation but uh the two you point out are, are super interesting so uh, mark cuban was actually one of our earliest investors and uh, he, he invested us pretty early on when we were in y combinator first got in contact with with mark on you know 11 p.m. on a Sunday night, and he responds within 10 minutes. And it's amazing. Mark can respond within 10 minutes to any email ever. He's incredibly responsive. So he's like, make me an offer. So we go all hands on deck, and we're writing up this email, and we think we're so clever. And we're like, oh, we'll, we'll paint a sea glider with Maverick's livery, and we'll deliver it to your beach house, and we'll teach you how to fly it, and you can do all these great vacation operations. You get the very first one off the line. Thought we're so clever. And he basically comes back to us and says, uh, make me a deal with money. <laughs> you know, we're talking <laughs> valuation here. W what's it going to take? So that negotiation went on. You know, every night we'd check in. We got two back and forths with Mark. We knew that you know that like eleven or twelve p.m. Like we were ready to go. Um, and by the end of the week, we got a deal done, which, which was awesome. And so it, it's been great. You know, having Mark on board. Uh, Lockheed has been a, a recent partner of ours as this uh, defense mission, defense vertical has really grown for us. So. Um, you know, to be able to have sort of the the breadth and expansiveness of Lockheed, to be able to talk to Lockheed about strategic interests, and now that we're on contract with our with the Marine Corps and in, in Regent's first defense contract, it's really exciting to sort of be able to uh, work with Lockheed now and say, you know, what can we do together to sort of grow the pie? Your uh, your Marine Corps contract that's with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Yes, is that right? Yep. The so we are recording on the Marines birthday today. So I just want to say uh, happy birthday to all the Marines out there. I'm sure this is going to air, air a little bit later, but, <laughs> but what is the, uh, what is the, the contract for? What are you, what are you doing with, with McWill? The, the Marine Corps has a strategic focus on force design 2030. So moving to more distributed assets that are commercially available, faster moving, less expensive, easier to operate. And that's exactly what sea gliders are in this context. So we can bring thousands of sea gliders to be doing logistics mission and specifically focused on that capability gap in high speed logistics and in contested logistics today, which is really the bread and butter of the sea gliders mission, uh, supporting logistics operations in island chains, moving through islands quickly, doing it low to the water and fast and quietly with the all electric propulsion system so that they're hard to see. Obviously, the, the Marine Corps has been very interested in this as a, as a capability. There's a long path to sort of inform a requirement and develop a program of record. So this first step with Marine Corps Warfighting Lab uh, is really just bringing them inside and taking them through the process with us. So uh, we're collaborating on design reviews, on certification and training requirements, on testing process, which will eventually accumulate in demos for them, float foil and flight demos with, with Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Um, and really just sort of building, set, setting the groundwork to build the relationship for what uh, hopefully will eventually become a, a program of record. If uh, someone from the Marine Corps becomes a captain of a region vessel, does that mean they have to join the Navy? Do they have to leave the Marine Corps if they're going <laughs> to captain a vessel? I don't know. This is like an identity <laughs> crisis in the making, right. potentially. So the opportunity here is that you don't need pilots, right? You think about a, a two-year training pathway for a pilot in the middle of an already existing pilot shortage it's it's very difficult to say hey you know go train thousands more pilots and get them out there so this is aircraft speed and therefore you know aircraft resupply logistics capabilities uh, but we can put enlisted servicemen and women at the helm of this with these very short training programs you drive sea gliders like you drive boats they just go much faster and so that's really the opportunity here you know, we're starting with the Marine Corps. There are obviously opportunities in the Navy. I'm sure many people listening have, have heard the adage that uh, the Army has more boats than the Navy. So there's opportunities in the in the Army as well for this. Yeah, interestingly, the Army has the DOD mission for ship to shore logistics, not the Navy or the Marine Corps. So that saying is is very much true. I think the use case for the Marine Corps is fascinating because with the with the pivot of Force Design 2030. You have EBAO, which is what you alluded to. That's the uh, Expeditionary Advanced Space Operations concept, basically island hopping. And then you have the Marine Littoral Regiments that are being activated to, to operate in that first island chain, uh, which is about 300 miles from mainland China. But it has like 10,000 islands. And so the ability to, to move logistics 
um, without being dependent on a landing craft to go ashore or a runway or an, a landing zone, I think is, is a very compelling use case. Exactly. And that, that's really been, uh, you know, the, the focus of our uh, defense business development campaign here. And I, I think the interesting part sort of going back to the, you know, thing we were talking about early was sort of our dual use companies real or our dual use hardware companies real the mark of a successful dual use company and especially a hardware dual use company is that they can sell the same widget to their commercial and their defense customers. Uh, and so that's, that's really what we've been focused on here and building this, this defense focused business unit is that our all electric sea glider vehicle that we're selling to our commercial customers, uh, that groups like Hawaiian airlines and Japan airlines are interested in this, uh, 180 mile, 180 mile an hour machine that can take 12 people is actually the same one that defense is interested in, that the Marine Corps is interested in for these high speed logistics missions for the existing hub spoken node operations that we're doing today. Because it turns out that the radii of these hub and spoke networks are on the order of 150, 200 miles anyways. So a lot of times we get pushback, hey, can, can you really sort of overcome the tyranny of distance that everyone always talks about? The tyranny of distance in the Pacific with an all electric vehicle, don't you need to go hybrid? Uh, there are certainly opportunities for that more regional distance, the, the more connecting island chains and overcoming that tyranny of distance. Um, but in the near term, we can take that all electric vehicle with order 200 mile range and just drop it in on our existing hub and spoke networks. And it'll actually work very well as a logistics platform. So not only is the, the vehicle capability, the range uh, and, and the, the mission aligned, but the geography is also aligned. So you talk about you know key island chains where it makes sense in the focus on the Indo-Pacific, Hawaii and Japan. And those are actually some of our hottest markets where, where we have our most commercial establishment too. You know, you'll notice Hawaiian Airlines and Japan Airlines, both investors, in Regent as well. So that's another really great synergy we have that you know makes us excited about this potential to be one of the, the few successful hardware dual use companies. I've said it a couple of times, I think on the pod, uh, definitely have said it in person if, you, if, if anyone ever asked me. I'm pretty uh, bearish on eVTOL aircraft for a whole bunch of reasons with um, just specific energy of a battery pack and, and how they're designed. That can only go so far, so fast, the uh, time to recharge. But with a wig, with the sea glider, you can go far and fast. And then as the batteries mature I would, in the next, you know, five or six years, you're upgrading your battery packs. And now your 180 mile range goes to like 280, 380 miles, right? You absolutely nailed it. And you think about, you know, how does EABO work uh, with with fueled vehicles today? You still got to get the, the fuel to the edge, right? So you're still pre-deploying fuel packs and using helicopters to fly it around or floating it out there. And so anytime you need to refuel the fuel pack, you have to support this whole, you know, supply chain to get the fuel out to the edge. So there's actually an opportunity here. People love to sort of poke at well, does, does electric really work in defense and are we greenwashing defense at the expense of the mission, stuff like that. But you can imagine now when we're talking about these large expanses of using what we have out there, it's about energy resiliency. It's, it's not about sustainability, it's about resiliency that we can float out a solar powered battery pack that's just floating in the middle of the Pacific and your sea glider or whatever other electric thing is out there goes up to it, plugs up, recharges, and it goes on its way. So now we can start to connect these floating solar powered fuel packs, which are actually battery packs that you can't see and are difficult to target. But now we have this amazing network. You can plug into it and you can serve as an ad hoc comms node or an ISR platform. You can go to an island and use wind or solar or geothermal as the case may be. And now we have this resilient fuel source, which also has the great benefit of being sustainable. Like that's awesome uh, that, you know, in this particular case, what can actually help with the mission and decrease, you know, the dependence on these fuel supply chains is also sustainable and good for the planet and also happens in general to be very quiet, <laughs> which is a, another great thing when we think about, you know, moving around the islands and, and our ability to be targeted. I saw your uh, board of advisors, um, just to go back to your point about dual use, you have a former Boeing CEO, you have a co-founder of JetBlue and a former commandant of the Marine Corps, right? <laughs> it's pretty, that's pretty much uh, down the middle for dual use. We've been, uh, we've been pretty fortunate. Yeah. 
uh, pretty fortunate in some of the advisory we, we've been able to sort of network to and, and brought on board. And all of these uh, leaders on, on our advisory board have, have just added tremendous value and experience and network, et cetera. But I think to some extent, even the, the reason that they've signed up and, and affiliated their names with us gives us some validation. You know, when we started out, it's like, this is crazy and this doesn't exist. And, you know, this has been attempted for 60 years and wigs have never caught on. So what makes a sea glider so different? Or it's not a boat and it's not a plane. I don't really get it. But, you know, seeing these leaders like Dennis Mullenberg, who who led, you know, Boeing, David Neeleman, who's, you know, probably the most successful airline entrepreneur ever between JetBlue and Azul and now Breeze, uh, General Neller, General Dana, General Trotman, all in the Marine Corps, you know, it's that they are thinking about new solutions to problems and new technologies. We've sort of come as a completely differentiated platform to what we've seen in EV toll or EC toll or, you know, whatever acronym is out there. And so we, we formed a really amazing team here of senior advisors. For platform certification, right, because it's a boat and it's not an aircraft, the certification is through the Coast Guard and not the FAA. Is that right? How How is that process playing out? Are they... Is the FAA at all fighting for jurisdiction? Does the Coast Guard want jurisdiction? Like, do they? Do neither of them want it? I could certainly <laughs> right. see that too. Like, <laughs> someone else deal with this. Right. We are sort of following the. I mean, we we are just following the rules of where certification takes us by statute and and by regulation. So there is existing statute and specific cutout for wing and ground vessels, uh, specifically Type A. So there are different types of wing and ground craft, but a Type A. Wing and ground craft stays in ground effect at all times, is dock to dock over water, is always below the height of a sailboat mast, for example, always in the maritime environment. And there are specific rules and cutouts uh, in US law as well that put that under Coast Guard jurisdiction. And indeed, the last time a wing and ground craft flew in the US in 1989, uh, it was also regulated by the Coast Guard. So there, there's precedent, there's statute for this, there is international precedent as well, an agreement between. The IMO, so the International Maritime Organization, and ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, that also puts Type A wing and ground craft under Coast Guard jurisdiction. So there's this great, you know, precedent rule set to start with. Now we're taking this obviously further than anyone's taken it before. We are, you know, going to mass produce these things and certify them and bring them to commercial and and defense markets. And so in that context, we are working with the U.S. Coast Guard right now as sort of our, our launch market. Uh, which is where we expect on the commercial side, the Surf Air, uh, which also operates as Southern Airways Express and Mokalele Airlines, actually in, in Hawaii, is our first launch customer. So we expect U.S. Uh, domestic operations as the first launch market. Uh, so we're working with the Coast Guard on the on the first step in that. That's called the Design Basis Agreement, and sort of akin to a CERT basis uh, in aviation nomenclature. Uh, so that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, we already have a similar document with what's called a classification society, which is sort of an international regulator. Uh, so that, that's a key first step in the certification process that we've already established. It's the set of rules and requirements, safety standards that we'll be certifying to. Now, in the U.S., there may be some interface between the Coast Guard and the FAA. The Coast Guard will be the authority. The FAA doesn't want to regulate this Um you know, they, they have their hands full already with 100 different EV tolls, and there is statute that says that uh, sea gliders are vessels. For example, we are in the coal regs, and we actually have a special light. So uh, if you see something on the water with a red blinky light, that is a wing and ground craft, uh, as opposed to all these other types of vessels. And also, interestingly, we are very last in the right-of-way rule, so don't worry about turning to avoid a red blinky light on the water. They always have to avoid you, no matter what kind of vessel you're in. Um, but there is this, you know, great existing statute. Uh, now, the FAA may come in as a subject matter expert in certain areas or approve certain standards. Uh, and right now, the, you know, the Coast Guard and the FAA are working on that process. But, you know, certainly wing and ground craft, sea gliders as a type of wing and ground craft are under uh, that Coast Guard jurisdiction, internationally IMO jurisdiction, as long as they're staying within that type A operations, which is over water only within a wingspan of the water only. One of the things I think is really interesting about that, though, is that you are then a software-defined boat, right? Because it's the software of your craft that limits it to within a wingspan of, of the water, which I think is maybe a... I don't know how many hardware categories there are that are out there where the software really changes the definition of the thing that you're dealing with. 
Well, I would say, you know, software is critical in uh, aviation certification today in terms of hitting the risk standards, you know, catastrophic events for commercial airliners need to happen and, you know, le with less than 10 of the minus ninth probability. And that is only affected through software right now. And so the, the ability to meet a certification standard and you cannot operate without meeting that certification safety standard is performed through software today. It is so intricately baked into our vehicle architectures and our certification process. Uh, so in this case, it's no different. From the operator's perspective, there is no way to remove the craft from ground effect. There is likely not even a pitch control or an altitude control lever, right? You press the takeoff button, you rise up into the air, settle into the ground effect 10 to 30 feet off the water, and then it's two-dimensional operations. And the only crew input is left, right, fast and slow, or press the land button. So the, the compliance with the regulation is that the vessel never leaves ground effect and cannot be removed from ground effect, is not capable of operation out of ground effect. And that is absolutely true for sea gliders. It is not capable of operation out of ground effect. The captain cannot remove it from ground effect. Well, you just answered my next like three questions about like wig A versus B <laughs> versus C. If you just kind of pull back on the pitch, but uh, okay, well, <laughs> everything seems like it's going great. I'd really like to hear about some of the pain points. Like what are the things that keep you up at night? Um, besides growing a company, obviously, like <laughs> I saw that you have like 400 and I don't know, 69 orders already with like a $8 billion backlog. Like that's a good problem to have, but <laughs> what, what are the things that, uh, from a dual use perspective, whether it's go to market on the commercial side or working with the Pentagon on the military side, what are the things that are like, man, you know, what grinds my gears? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, that that order book on, on the commercial side is something we think about a lot is, you know, how do we fulfill that order book, right? So manufacturing, like there are very few uh, aerospace grade, I, I will say even airplane manufacturers, aerospace grade manufacturer will certainly be aerospace grade, even though we're building a vessel that is certified under under maritime jurisdiction. There are very few successful ones around the planet because it takes a lot to spool up a manufacturing line with the quality standards, international support standards, uh, international footprint of maintenance and training and operations, right? There's so much there. So you found a company with these amazing dreams of there is this new technology that can change the way people move around coastlines all over the world that can reduce emissions and give time back to people and protect the warfighter. And then we make one and then we prove that it can work and we're about to put humans on board and prove that it can work at, at real scale and that it's safe enough. There is a huge gap. You know, we talk about the valley of death. There are multiple valleys of deaths and startups are just constantly building bridges over their valleys. So the next valley for us, uh, because I'm very confident in the ability of this team to, to deliver a full scale sea glider prototype that will fly humans on board. Um, we're funded through that milestone with our series A is that next step, right? How do we go from one to many? How do we scale manufacturing of this and, and get it to our customers who are all over the world now in six continents around the world, $8 billion on the commercial front, uh, and same for defense. And then so then we talk about how do we work with defense? How, how can we realize that interest and, and codify into a requirement that would inform a program of record? That is a really hard process uh, that is even harder when we're talking about fundamentally new technologies as opposed to iterations of old technologies. And the hard part there is that the sort of the acquisitions pathway is pretty well defined, but the, the new technology development pathway is much less defined. And there are some amazing innovation groups like Marine Corps Warfighting Lab or FWorks and DIU, et cetera, that are trying to grow this and are trying to get, you know, capital early because startups like Regent and other, uh, you know, defense tech uh, hardware startups are just capital intensive as we're building our stuff and testing it and making things out of atoms. But it's it's still hard, right? And, and these companies are still capital intensive. So the hard part now is like, how do we go from the single prototype? How do we scale this uh, maybe get learnings from multiple prototypes and then inform a manufacturing line, all of which take, you know, many tens of millions of dollars along the way. And then how can we generate that buy-in with the defense community so that it's not just, hey, I want to see the thing working and I'll buy a lot of them, but actually, you know, bring them on board uh, and getting some developmental capital along the way. Yeah, I always thought it was funny how on the, the dual use perspective, it was, if it's a pure defense thing, you can win a competition with a, with a, you know, a well-written proposal on a PowerPoint and it is dual use to like, well, I want to see it like, well, 
Uh, there is some concurrent development on both sides of the equation here. And it, I don't think a lot of people understand that. For sure. Uh, you know, that, that's sort of the challenge is, you know, the defense community is, is so uh, akin to their missions and, the, and, and some of the missions are so different that they're very good with coming up with new ideas. Hey, can the wings fold? Can we, can we stow it in the well deck? Can we beach the thing? Can we make it hybrid and go a little further? And those are great, you know, options for product upgrades for us. And we're certainly listening and we're, we're figuring out the art of the possible with, with what those could be. But we're also working very intentionally to sort of pull that back and say, well, let's start with this. Let's start with what we're selling on the commercial side this 200 mile machine that's powered by batteries with 3,500 pounds of payload. What can you do with that? And, and the Marine Corps says, well, we can do a lot with that. We can, we can use that in our uh, hub spoken node logistics networks and we can use that today. And then we can grow for the rest uh, and sort of thinking about it in new ways. Well, yes, it's range limited because it's electric, but why don't we use it on the short range missions? And then the long range vehicles, the aircraft platforms that we're using for these short range missions now it actually frees them up. So not only are we saving time and saving cost and, and enabling a faster training pathway by using sea gliders on the short range missions, but we're freeing up these other assets, these exquisite assets to do the long range missions they were actually designed for. So there's this great sort of carry on effect, waterfall effect of, of value by just getting more stuff into the Indo-Pacific and, and we fit into that mold. Have you had any conversations with the U.S. Coast Guard? It seems like there's definitely some some homeland security applications or drug interdiction applications and harbor patrol, all kinds of stuff. 100%. Um, not only, you know, patrol and interdiction, but also medevac and, and casavac sort of applications as well. Um, absolutely uh, very working very closely with the Coast Guard. We're, we're in this very interesting situation that's different than aviation, where we have in, in sort of a single entity, uh, both our regulatory authority and a potential customer. So um, that's a great relationship too. Obviously, those are different sections of the Coast Guard. But it means I can sort of be weighing in on operational considerations and requirements in addition to the, the certification process. Oh, yeah. You just gave some Coast Guard lawyer a heart attack. They're going to hear that snippet <laughs> and uh, definitely freak out a little bit. Uh, fortunately, it is different sections within the Coast Guard. <laughs> they have they have <laughs> controls for this. I mean, you, you think about sort of new vessel certification, too, right? And it, it's the same situation. Like the Coast Guard... For every boat they they approve and inspect, they're also buying ships. So it's it's happened with every single ship they've bought to date. Fair point. Fair point. All right. So you started the company in Rhode Island. Why did you pick Rhode Island? I will say it seems to be a lot of interesting maritime startups uh, popping up. But I think you might have been the first, or at least the first, to really put your stamp on the region. So we were actually founded in the Boston area. Uh, you know, we were a lot of XMIT guys, X Aurora Flight Sciences guys working in sort of the greater Boston area. Uh, so we actually looked all around the country and said, where does it make sense to, to set up region? So, you know, here are some of our requirements. We needed protected inland waterways for early testing, right? So we needed a good harbor. Uh, so that ruled out most of California. We needed deep harbor because we have hydrofoils. So we want to be able to test these big hydrofoils and make sure it doesn't hit anything. So that ruled out Miami, Biscayne Bay is too shallow, ruled out Houston because there's, you know, old oil drills underwater that aren't mapped. We needed access to the ocean so that once we really mature these platforms, we can take them out to the ocean, really put them through their paces, ocean waves, ocean wind, and do longer routes. So that ruled out Seattle, which is too far from the ocean, Wilmington, too far from the ocean. So we sort of settled on Massachusetts, Boston area, Boston Harbor, Rhode Island, uh, and actually Tampa Bay was great. So we, we've actually done operations in, in all of them. We first tested our prototype in Tampa. Next, it came down really to, to talent. And so we found in the Northeast, and we, we were also from the Northeast, but just an immense amount of talent, actually double what we were seeing in, in Florida for some of our you know flight controls, flight software, some of the more aerospace science-y positions. We're in recruiting range of schools like MIT uh, and Harvard. And then what we found in Rhode Island specifically uh, was amazing facilities. So uh, we have this opportunity to grow very, very quickly in the manufacturing facilities, which are right on the water, an incredible depth of maritime talent. This is the center of the sailing world in, in the country. Uh, so we have composite boat builders and naval architects and hydrodynamicists here in droves and just a, a very maritime focused, maritime friendly state. We're in the ocean state here and we're building maritime technology. So for all those reasons, we sort of looked all over and, and honed in on Rhode Island and, and it's we've been very happy since we've gotten here. 
Awesome. It sounds like a great sales pitch for Rhode Island. <laughs> Absolutely. What, you, you can't beat summers in Rhode Island. So I'll put it against any state in the nation. <laughs> Can we, should we start calling it the like El Segundo of the East? Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, the El Segundo of the East, the Silicon Valley of the East, like any of these things, it'll, it'll start to catch up. There we go. Better yeah. than Miami. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually, we're doing a lot of commercial operations in Miami, so I, I do love Miami too, but uh, we're, we're manufacturing more <laughs> <on> balance. <laughs> All right, well, we're out of time. You got to go. Uh, that's the pod. Check it out on YouTube and look at the uh, the pictures and videos. We'll put it, we'll splice them into the episode so you guys can see what we're talking about. Amazing vehicles slash boats slash things. They're not airplanes. Check it out, and uh, and we'll put a link to the show notes to uh, to Regent so you guys can track what they're doing. Billy, congratulations! Thanks for making time for us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me on, and uh, keep going with this thing. I love the pod. Thanks, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. See ya. That's it. We'll see ya.